leave your hair looking radiantly alive. And Crest Toothpaste with Floristan. And now here he is, Mr. This Is Your Life himself, Ralph Edwards. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to This Is Your Life. Now watch and listen. The record that you're hearing was introduced by tonight's subject on the Kraft Television Theater's production of Singin' Idol just two months ago. Now, he's one of the youngest subjects we've ever had. A lad who has hit teenage America like a bombshell. Right now, he's behind this door in the studio here with our old friend Tennessee Ernie Ford, who's being interviewed by Jim Bacon of the Associated Press. Now, Ernie and Jim know that we're going to interrupt their conversation, but our subject doesn't. Well, let's walk into the studio now and see what happens. Hi, Jim. How are you? How are you? Good to see you, boys. Thanks a lot. This is, I've heard this before. <laughs> How are you? Well, Ron? I'm fine. Who are you got to... My friend Tommy, Mr. Bacon, you know. Jim yeah, I know Bacon. Jim. Hello, oh, Jim Bacon. Nice to Tommy see you, Tommy. Sands. No. How are you, Hiya, Tommy? It's very nice to know you. Well, nice seeing you. I, I, uh, I feel as if I, I know you pretty well. Uh, do you want to tell him, Ernie, or should I? Ralph, you say it so well, and I, I, I want to hear you say it, Ralph. Well, Tommy Sands... <clears throat> Hold on to your hat because 30 million people are waiting for me to say tonight, this is your life. <laughs> I get the feeling like this studio is sort of an acting ground for us. <laughs> How about this, guy? Ralph, you have made a wonderful choice in uh, picking a young fellow here, and he is really young and to show the people across the country that it isn't so easy for a young person to start out and make a name for themselves like this fellow is. It takes friends, discouragement, and hard work, and you picked the right fellow. Ernie, you're so right, and uh, certainly you, Tommy, have had your share of all these. Our thanks to you, Tennessee Ernie Ford, uh, who's been one of Tommy's <laughs> closest friends. We'll be looking at your show tomorrow night. Gang, we'll all be watching. What a cast. Must be a big show tomorrow night. Thank you, Ron. Uh, the Ford Show. And thank you, Jim Bacon, very much of the Associated Press for helping us surprise this young man tonight. Oh, what an evening we're in for. Uh, Tommy, if you'll come with me across the hall to our studio, let's see how a little boy with a great desire to sing, he wants to shake hands Tom, with you here. I just want to say it's been swell. When you get over there, this man will put you through the ring. <laughs> it's a most exciting career. And while we go, here's Bob Warren with a girl who plans to keep them guessing. Come on, Tommy. Bob. <laughs> That looks like someone's getting ready for the masquerade ball. That's the audience out there, Tommy. <laughs> oh, thank you, Bob Warren. Come on, sit down here, Tommy Sands. Oh. Ernie Ford says, well, I got in on it. That entitles me to the party, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> we oh. were going to go over and have a meal, you know, and I was starved to death, but now I don't think I could eat a bite. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to have uh, the meal afterwards, and old Ernie will be over there, too, the whole gang. Tommy Sands, just two weeks ago, Tonight, you were singing Dimitri Tiomkin's theme song from Friendly Persuasion at the Academy Awards. Yes, sir. Quite an honor for a young man who only nine months ago came to Hollywood. Completely unknown. Now, this past Sunday, you were in New York singing on Steve Allen's show. Tomorrow night, you're appearing with Jack Benny on the Shower of Stars. Yes. And on May 9th, you open at the Roxy Theater in New York City. Now, how could all of this happen so quickly to a boy only 19 years old? Well, let's find out. This is your life, Tommy Sands. The Charlie Teenage Crash. That's it. That's your own voice. We're hearing Tommy, the song you introduced on the Singing Idol, uh, and that has become one of the best-selling records. That was the Kraft TV show you did. Uh, the best-selling records in the country, Teenage Crush. But at the time that you're born, at Grant Hospital in Chicago on August 27th, 1937, 
There's certainly no thought in anyone's mind that someday cheering teenagers would be following the every move of Thomas Adrian Sand. We understand, however, that you started singing when you were still in diapers, right? I was trying. <laughs> yeah, there's a picture of you. You just got a little bit of it there. And uh, that when you were about four years old, you'd stand outside uh, the hotel in which you were living and whistle at the girls. Can you remember back that far or not, Tommy? I still do. You still <laughs> if Tommy can, I certainly can. Remember the minstrel show we put on at the Fullerton Presbyterian Church in Chicago? Two friends of yours from your oh, Chicago Brody days. Nelson, Tommy, you, yes indeed. Come on out, specialist second class, Sidney Lewis, and flown here from Yokohama, <laughs> Japan. Yeah. Airman first class, Ronnie yeah. Nelson. The Glenview Naval Air Base in Glenview, Illinois. Oh, boy. This is quite a reunion, isn't it, Sid? Yes, it is. I haven't seen Tommy in about three years now. Yeah? Growing up, they outgrew me. <laughs> you all were pretty close buddies back in Chicago, weren't you, Sid? Yeah, we sure were, Ralph. Uh, I remember one time when Ronnie and Tommy here and I were all up at his place reading comic books. Yeah. Next morning, I woke up with measles, or with the mumps, rather. <laughs> Tommy woke up with the mumps, but Ronnie... He never uh -uh. got <laughs> I, I was lucky, but Tommy didn't let me get away with that, though. He fixed me up later. I had a date with him, uh, or for him, with this little gal, and uh, we were to double and go to a movie. And, uh, well, Tommy came to the movie a little bit later after we had gotten there, the uh, two girls and myself, and... He stayed about 10 minutes, and then he says, well, Ryan, he says, I've got to get home. He got up, walked out, and left me sitting there with the two gals. You know? <laughs> well, Tommy was interested in uh, performing even as a young boy, wasn't he, Sid? Yes, he was. Uh, we did that menstrual show over at the Fullerton Presbyterian Church, mm -hmm. and we were pretty good. They took us out in the South Side. We did a couple more performances. Tommy was a little disappointed. There was no rock and roll in the show. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Sid Lewis and Ronnie Nelson, for being here tonight. You and Tommy will really have a chance to talk about old times later on at the party at the Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel, where all of your friends are going to stay. <laughs> Because I ought to have a girl. While Chicago is your home, you and your mother would take yearly trips to visit your uncle and aunt, who lived on a farm outside of Shreveport, Louisiana. Remember? Yes, Yeah. One of these trips, when you're about eight years old, you listen to the radio every morning. You hear Harmy Smith and Otis Eccles, singers of country songs, on radio station KWKH in Shreveport. Yes, sir. Tommy told me that he'd rather meet Harmy Smith and Otis Eccles than anyone in the world. No need to tell you who that is, That's Tommy. Your number one fan, your mom, Mrs. Grace Sands. Oh, Mom. <laughs> Come on, stand over here. I tell you, she's so happy this thing is finally underway, Tommy. She's had to keep this secret. I bet you wondered why she... You know, I was wondering why she was so nervous. We were just going over to Mr. Ford's to eat dinner, you know, and she was so down. <laughs> <laughs> We, we couldn't hardly get her in the car. She said, I'm not going to go. I'm not going to go. <laughs> oh, I tell you, it's really been a chore. But bless your heart, Miss Sands. It's really worked out, and we fooled this guy. What happened when you took uh, Tommy to meet Harmy Smith, Miss Sands? Uh, Harmy told Tommy several cards on, on the guitar. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I found that Tommy was really enthusiastic, I bought him a 25-cent chord book. Do you remember, son? Sure do, Mom. You had written a letter to Santa Claus, Tommy, requesting something for Christmas, I think. But, uh, hadn't you? What was that? Yes, sir. It was, well, I asked for a horse and for a guitar, and mostly a guitar, though. That's what yeah. I wanted. And Santa did pretty well by Tommy, didn't he, Miss Sam? Yes, he got the guitar, and the following spring, his brother bought him a pony. Yes. I should say. And here is your brother, Tommy, Dr. Edward Deem of uh, Anaheim, uh -huh. California. <laughs> You know how proud we all are of you, Tommy. Carol and the kids are watching in tonight, and they all send their love. They sure uh -huh. are. Wait to them out there, the little kids right out there. They want to see Uncle Tommy. <laughs> thank you, Mrs. Sands, Dr. Dean. Thank you. We'll see Tommy a little later. A, you're adorable. B, you're so beautiful. C, you're a cutie for the child. Now that you have a guitar, you spend every possible minute practicing. A year goes by. You're nine years old now and back in Shreveport again. 
Usually we're saying 50 years and 70 or 39 years old. Your mother wants to buy you a new and better guitar, but she must pay so much a week until you can actually take it out of the shop. And then comes the day of the last payment. You and your uncle go into town, and he drops you off at the music store to pick up your guitar. And you're to meet him later at the city hall, but you didn't show up. Uh, what happened, Tommy? Well, I remember I got the guitar, and I was walking down the street, and I walked by this radio station that uh, my favorite, Harmy Smith and Otis Eccles and all those those guitar players were playing on, you know, and, mm -hmm. and I I just wanted to go in, you know, and, and sing for him. So I went in, and, and uh, Otis Eccles was there, and he had a program, and I auditioned. It's, it's pretty hard to remember. It's so far back. Otis Jr. kind of put the good word in, didn't he, to he his sure father? He sure did, yeah. I'll yeah. never be able to, to repay him for and that. And Otis Sr. Senior let you sing right away then, almost. He let me sing, yes, sir. And I remember my uncle nearly had a heart attack when I <laughs> was on the radio because it was his favorite program, you know. Sure. Your folks at home had no idea that this was happening. <laughs> but they had the radio tuned up to Pop Eccles' program, and there you were. How was Tommy on his premiere appearance, Mrs. Sands? Unbelievably bad. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievably bad. But Pop Eccles took That's a... pretty bad. <laughs> well, Pop took a liking to you, Tommy. You appeared with him once a week for the rest of the summer. Yes, sir. You're only nine years old. Tommy was not only a success singing on the radio at this time, but he also took a turn at preaching. Well, now there's the voice of someone you used to call your second mother. Do you know Ms. who it is? Prosper. Yes, your Sunday school teacher at the Greenwood Methodist <laughs> Church in Greenwood, Louisiana, <laughs> Mrs. James Prosper. <laughs> oh, dear. What is this about Tommy's preaching, Mrs. Prosper? Oh, Tommy was so enthusiastic about his church and Sunday school that he thought he wanted to become a minister. Mm -hmm. Tommy, I'll always remember you standing on the soapbox, preaching your nine-year-old heart out to two little country boys. <laughs> and they looked up at you with such devotion. But although Tommy hasn't turned out to be a preacher, Mrs. Trosper, he's kept his deep religious feeling, hasn't he? Yes, he has, Ralph. In spite of all of this wonderful glamour and acclaim, Tommy still goes to church once a week. Mm -hmm. If I could have had a son, Tommy, I would have wanted him to be just like you. Thank you, Mrs. Thank James you. Prosper, Greenwood, Louisiana. Gee, it to be an oddly. Why can my baby back home? How you doing, boy? Wow, this is some dinner. <laughs> <laughs> After appearing for the summer with Pop Eccles, you return to Chicago. Your father, Ben Sands, is a musician with Art Castle's dance band. He's on the road a good bit of the time, and it's always a happy reunion when he comes back to town. Well, this is your life, and your dad is a mighty important part of it, so come on out, Mr. Ben Sands of Chicago. <laughs> Come on over here. Uh, just stand by the by the couch. Uh, yeah, you uh, saw Dad I last just week when Gee, you went and back he didn't, for he Steve. didn't make out like anything was going to happen. No, no we really keep noticed. secrets. When Tommy came home after this summer in Shreveport, uh, he did several shows in Chicago, didn't he, Mr. Sands? Yes, he he was put on the uh, on the uh, uh, WBK WBKB band dance, and from this, he joined the Lady of the Mountain show with Barbara Allen Rogers mm -hmm. and Mary Jane Johnson. You remember that show, don't you, Tommy? Sure, I'll never forget it. You're on the Lady of the Mountain program for about a year, Tommy. And it's also now, and uh, uh, great change is about to take place in your young life. Uh, what it is, we'll find out in just a moment. But first, uh, Dad, you stick around and chat with Tommy for a minute. And let's listen to Gordon Dilworth oh, as he sings us a ballad about a fisherman named Wim. We've been visiting with the family back here. Let's get back to the story of your life. Sit down, me lad. We're in Shreveport, Louisiana. The year is 1950. You're 12 years old. This is your life. Too young, I say. She said. You know that uh, singing is to be your career now. You appear on the Louisiana Hayride radio program every Saturday night. 
You meet a man named Tillman Franks who handles talent on the Western Circuit around Shreveport, and he takes you to Houston, Texas, hoping that he can find additional work for you there. Remember the old jalopy you and your mother drove to Houston town? Well, I'm sure I don't have to tell you who that Bill, is, Tommy. Yes, indeed. <laughs> the man who gave you a real break when you needed it. He's flown here from New York in the Philip Morris Country Music Show, your friend, Biff Polly. <laughs> Two days I sat in New York waiting for you. Biff, huh? get them over here. <laughs> These young ones get away from me. I can handle the older ones. But... <laughs> Did things go pretty well for uh, Tommy in Houston, uh, Biff? Well, uh, he was a pretty busy guy. Uh, <laughs> Thanks to, to you. Yeah, wait a minute. <laughs> going to school in the daytime and uh, working on singing jobs uh, at night and on weekends. Yes. But uh, uh, his mom, Mrs. Sands, was working as a sales lady there in Houston at Foley's department store, and he, uh, Tommy sort of supplemented the family income with every kind of job that he could make because he uh, needed it to pay the bills. But, of course, uh, Tommy loved to sing, so it was really not much of a situation of work as far as he was concerned. On top of all of this, Tommy had always wanted to be an actor. I shall never forget his performance in our production of The Magic Fallacy. Yes, another friend of yours, Tommy. You've said that if you ever did a play on Broadway, you'd want her to direct you. Miss Nina Vance of the Alley Theater in Houston, Texas. Here's this one. You were casting a uh, child's part in a play when Tommy was brought to your attention. Is that not right? Yes, I was. A number of young children had been interviewed, but when Tommy was brought in, I was so impressed with his ability, his talent, his natural good manners, that I cast him as the lead in the play. Yes. Uh, had you ever really acted before, Tommy? Well, that's a funny thing, because all through school I wanted to get in the plays, you know, but they wouldn't put me in them. <laughs> so along with school and working at singing jobs to help with the family finances, you accept the part, uh, which means long hours of rehearsals. But it all worked out very well. Tommy worked for eight weeks in the Magic Fallacy, and at the end of that time, because of his fine acting job, he was selected by a committee from newspaper critics to receive the Sidney Holmes Memorial Award as the Outstanding Young Actor of the Season, 1951-1952. Thank you, Nina Vance, for taking time out from your busy schedule to be here with us tonight. And Tommy, I know that everyone in Houston will want to see your present production of A View from the Bridge, followed by The Lark. Good luck and thank you so much. You stick around here with us, Beth. You stay here. Here in the early 1950s, you, Tommy, are enjoying quite a bit of success, right, Beth? Yes, that, uh, Ralph, you know what? Uh, an audience, as a rule, will, will take to a young one who uh, can sing or do something passably well. And as a kid, Tommy uh, sang and sold very well. Yeah. Of course, uh, when he got into his teens and uh, his uh, stature, uh, his voice, and his appearance changed, uh, he found it a little tougher going because he had tougher competition. And when things did get discouraging, Tommy, and you felt like chucking the whole thing, what would Biff Colley tell you? Well, he'd always, he'd always come to me and have something real real nice to say, and that's why I always will consider him uh, like a... Uh, Look out. <laughs> well, I don't know. He, he was just so much help to me. He always told me to, to keep going and, and not to worry and to work. And he always said quality was the main thing, and if you had quality, someday it'd pay off. Right. Thank you, Biff Colley. Thank you so much. I love you like I do. Before, things just aren't going well at all for you in Houston. Colonel Tom Parker, Elvis Presley's manager, tries to help you, but jobs are scarce. And while you want to sing, there aren't enough people who want to listen to 16-year-old Tommy Sands. You go back to Shreveport and find a job as a seven-hour-a-day disc jockey over radio station KCIJ and work there from September until June of 1956. In July of 1956, Tommy and my mother came out here to California to visit me and to seek greener pastures for Tommy's talents. So at 18, you arrive in Hollywood, Tommy, without a job, without knowing anyone here in the entertainment business, and with very little money. But Tommy's desire to sing was not to be denied. Yes, another of your friends, Tommy, a guy who has helped so many people, including our pal, Tennessee Ernie Ford, Cliffy Stone, the one and only Cliffy Stone. Tommy called and asked if uh, he could sing for you, didn't he? Cliffy? That's right. He called me on the phone, so I said, well, come out and sing for me at Hometown Jamboree. And he did, and he didn't seem to be like uh, really Tommy. It sounded like somebody else, so I said, Tommy, don't impersonate, just be yourself, and maybe you'll make it on your own talent. So he came back, and the people loved him, and Tennessee Ernie Ford saw him on our show and asked him to be on his network television show, and 
That was it. You bet. That was it. And thanks to you, Cliffy Stone, for taking your place in Tommy's life. Well, the rest is fast and furious, Tommy. Your appearance on The Singing Idol, your singing at the Academy Awards, your appearances on the major nighttime television programs, and more, too, which we'll talk about later. Tommy, how does it feel to have all of this success come so suddenly? Well, uh, it makes me think back for about 11 years, I guess, all the years that I've been in show business. It makes me think of all the wonderful people that I've met, and I realize that it's not my talent. Uh, I realize that because everybody, whether it was Harmie Smith or Otis Eccles or Flippy Stone or my mother, anybody that's in this room tonight, Colonel Tom Parker, they've all been such a help to me. And uh, without these people, and without the people out there, I know that none of these wonderful things would have happened. Tommy, right now, let's go back in time again to the little boy with his brand new guitar and his first great desire to sing. And to the man who gave that desire expression. You haven't seen him since you were nine or ten years old, but it wouldn't be your life without him. Here from radio station KCLV in Clovis, New Mexico, is Otis Pop Eccles. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Tommy. You know, Tommy, it's wonderful to see you after these many years. You know, I knew you as a little boy, a talented little boy down in Shreveport. That's right. And I just, I'm happy to say that I'm mighty glad to, to, that I played my small part in making you and putting you where you are today. You are a real star. And millions of young people are going to follow you across the nation. You realize that? Well. And I know you're the type of fellow that will live up to that responsibility. That's right. Thank you, sir. Come on, gang. Sit right over here. Only 19 years of your life have gone by, Tommy Sands, but you've already filled them with hard work and excitement. The horizons are bright for you, and there's no predicting to what heights your star may rise. But whatever heights you reach, we know you'll always wear your mantle of fame with dignity. Now, we'll talk more about that in a moment. First, uh, you hold Mom's hand, stick around there. Let's show all the gals watching how to look their exciting best any season of the year with liquid. Trail had Marshall Jewelers of New York City uh, design this handsome gold money clip and matching cufflinks and tie bar for you. Just specially designed records and so forth for your mother. Here you are, boy. Prell has this uh, beautiful gold charm bracelet, each charm a memento of some memorable event in your life. And for Dad, a pair of cufflinks to remind him of his son, too. And we also have for you a complete film of tonight's program and the 16-millimeter Bell & Howell motion picture sound projector and camera. Well, you're going to be a busy boy, Tommy. You've just signed a movie contract with 20th Century Fox. As you may have read in Daily Variety today, Buddy Adler, your new boss, expected to be here in somebody's life tonight. It was to be yours, but at the last minute, he was called out of town. On your way to New York in the Roxy Theater there, uh, May 9th, the Kraft TV Theater, just before it, you'll be uh, stopping off at Truth or Consequence in New Mexico for their eighth annual fiesta, April 25th through 28th so that you'll feel right at home. Here's a cowboy hat. Bob Warren, let's have it. Put it on him, will you? To wear in the big parade there, boy. Most of the songs that uh, we've heard you sing tonight are from your new long-playing Capitol record album, Steady Date, uh, which will be <laughs> in the record stores very soon. Your first record, Teenage Crush, has just gone over the top of the one million mark. And here's your friend, Ken Nelson, of Capitol Records, with a really big surprise for you. Ken, what do you got to say here? Capitol Records presents you with this gold record in honor of the fact that Teenage Crush has passed the million mark. Oh. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. Music is your life now, Tommy Sands, and Krell would like to enrich your musical hours with this magnificent Magnavox High Fidelity Imperial Symphony radio phonograph and matching speaker, the finest instrument of its kind because it's a Magnavox. Now, we know that you've wanted this for a long time, and there it is, <laughs> buddy boy. <laughs> there are many more pages to be written as your life progresses, Tommy many more. Tommy Sands. May those pages be filled with the same good fortune, good friends, and humility as the ones we have relived with you tonight. Good night, and God bless you, Tommy. Our guests were flown here by TWA, Trans World Airlines, who now fly the newest and most luxurious airplane in the skies. Fly the finest. Fly TWA Super G Constellation.
Thanks, Bob Warren. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure you'll want to join me in congratulating Ilsa Stanley, one of our principal subjects, for having written this fine book, <laughs> The Unforgotten. It's in the bookstores today, and I'm sure you'll want to pick up a copy and relive with Ilsa her exciting experiences in Nazi Germany and her years of adjustment to a new life here in America. Good luck, Ilsa Stanley, with this wonderful book. Next week, ladies and gentlemen, we have another great life for you. Who is it going to be? We'll tell you next week. Be sure and be with us a week from tonight. Good night, all. Good night, Tommy. Good luck, boys. This is Your Life. It's a Ralph Edwards production produced by Axel Gruenberg and directed by Richard Gottlieb. This is Your Life has been presented by Crest Toothpaste with Floristan and by New Liquid Brell, the shampoo that's extra rich to leave your hair looking radiantly alive. Be sure to watch the Loretta Young Show next Sunday night over most of these same stations. <laughs> Leave your hair looking radiantly alive. And Crest Toothpaste with Floristan. And now here he is, Mr. This Is Your Life himself, Ralph Edwards. <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to This Is Your Life. Now watch and listen. The Charlie Teenage Crash. The record that you're hearing was introduced by tonight's subject on the Kraft Television Theater's production of Sing an Idol just two months ago. Now, he's one of the youngest subjects we've ever had. A lad who has hit teenage America like a bombshell. Right now, he's behind this door in the studio here with our old friend Tennessee Ernie Ford, who's being interviewed by Jim Bacon of the Associated Press. Now, Ernie and Jim know that we're going to interrupt their conversation, but our subject doesn't. Well, let's walk into the studio now and see what happens. <laughs> Hi, Jim. How are you? Good to see you, boys. Thanks a lot. This is, I've heard this before. <laughs> How are you? Well, Rob? I'm fine. Who are you got to... My friend Tommy, Mr. Bacon, you know. Jim yeah, I know Bacon. Jim. Hello, oh, Jim Bacon. Nice to Tommy see you, Tommy. Sands. No. How are you, Hiya, Tommy? It's very nice to know you. Well, nice seeing you. I, I, uh, I feel as if I, I know you pretty well. Uh, do you want to tell him, Ernie, or should I? Ralph, you say it so well, and I, I, I want to hear you say it, Ralph. Well, Tommy Sands... <clears throat> Hold on to your hat because 30 million people are waiting for me to say tonight, this is your life. <laughs> I get the feeling like this studio is sort of... Sands, it's really worked out and we fooled this guy. What happened when you took uh, Tommy to meet Harmy Smith, Miss Sands? Uh, Harmy told Tommy several cards on, on the guitar. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I found that Tommy was really enthusiastic, I bought him a 25-cent chord book. Do you remember, son? Sure do, Mom. You had written a letter to Santa Claus, Tommy, requesting something for Christmas, I think. But, uh, hadn't you? What was that? Yes, sir. It was, well, I asked for a horse and for a guitar, and mostly a guitar, though. That's what yeah. I wanted. And Santa did pretty well by Tommy, didn't he, Miss Sam? Yes, he got the guitar, and the following spring, his brother bought him a pony. Yes. I should say. And here is your brother, Tommy, Dr. Edward Deem of uh, Anaheim, uh -huh. California. <laughs> You know how proud we all are of you, Tommy. Carol and the kids are watching in tonight, and they all send their love. They sure uh -huh. are. Way to them out there, the little kids right out there. They want to see Uncle Tommy. <laughs> thank you, Mrs. Sands, Dr. Dean. Thank you. We'll see Tommy a little later. Now that you have a guitar, you spend every possible minute practicing. A year goes by. You're nine years old now and back in Shreveport again. Usually we're saying 50 years and 70 or 30. Nine years old. Your mother wants to buy you a new and better guitar, but she must pay so much a week until you can actually take it out of the shop. 
And then comes the day of the last payment. You and your uncle go into town, and he drops you off at the music store to pick up your guitar. And you're to meet him later at the city hall, but you didn't show up. Uh, what happened, Tommy? Well, I remember I got the guitar, and I was walking down the street, and I walked by this radio station that uh, my favorite, Harmy Smith and Otis Eccles and all those, those guitar players were playing on, you know, and, mm -hmm. and I, I just wanted to go in, you know, and, and sing for him. So I went in, and, and uh, Otis Eccles was there, and he had a program, and I auditioned. But all of this happened so quickly to a boy only 19 years old. Well, let's find out. This is your life, Tommy Sands. The Charlie the Teenage Crash. That's it. That's your own voice. We're hearing Tommy, the song you introduced on the Singing Idol, uh, and that has become one of the best-selling records. That was the Kraft TV show you did. Uh, the best-selling records in the country, Teenage Crush. But at the time that you're born, at Grant Hospital in Chicago on August 27th, 1937, there's certainly no thought in anyone's mind that someday cheering teenagers would be following the every move of Thomas Adrian Sand. We understand, however, that you started singing when you were still in diapers, right? I was trying. <laughs> yeah, there's a picture of you. You just got a little bit of it there. And uh, that when you were about four years old, you'd stand outside the, the hotel in which you were living and whistle at the girls. Can you remember back that far or not, Tommy? I still do. You still <laughs> if Tommy can't, I certainly can. Remember the minstrel show we put on at the Fullerton Presbyterian Church in Chicago? Two friends of yours oh, from your Chicago Ronnie days. Nelson, Tommy, you, yes indeed. Come on out, specialist second class, Sidney Lewis, and flown Sid here from Yokohama, <laughs> Japan. Yeah. Airman first class, Ronnie yeah. Nelson, now at the Glenview Naval oh, Air Base in Glenview, <laughs> Illinois. Oh boy, this is quite a reunion, isn't it, Sid? Yes, it is. <laughs> I haven't seen Tommy in about three years now. Yeah. Growing up, they outgrew me. <laughs> you all were pretty close buddies back in Chicago, weren't you, Sid? Yeah, we sure were, Ralph. Uh, I remember one time when Ronnie and Tommy here and I were all up at his place reading comic books. Yeah. Next morning, I woke up with measles, or with the mumps, rather. <laughs> Tommy woke up with the mumps, but Ronnie... He never uh -uh. got <laughs> I was lucky, but Tommy didn't let me get away with that, though. He fixed me up later. I had a date with him, uh, or for him, with this little gal. And <laughs> <laughs> How about this, guy? Ralph, you have made a wonderful choice in uh, picking a young fellow here, and he is really young, and to show the people across the country that it isn't so easy for a young person to start out and make a name for themselves like this fellow is. It takes friends, discouragement, and hard work, and you picked the right fellow. Ernie, you're so right. And uh, certainly you, Tommy, have had your share of all these. Our thanks to you, Tennessee Ernie Ford, uh, who's been one of Tommy's <laughs> closest friends. We'll be looking at your show tomorrow night. Gang, we'll all be watching. What a cast. Must be a big show tomorrow night. Thank you, Ron. Uh, the Ford Show. And thank you, Jim Bacon, very much of the Associated Press for helping us surprise this young man tonight. Oh, what an evening we're in for. Uh, Tommy, if you'll come with me across the hall to our studio, let's see how a little boy with a great desire to sing, he wants to shake hands Tom, with you here. I just want to say it's been swell. When you get over there, this man will put you through the ring. <laughs> it's a most exciting career. And while we go, here's Bob Warren with a girl who plans to keep them guessing. Come on, Tommy. Bob. <laughs> That looks like someone's getting ready for the masquerade ball. That's the audience out there, Tommy. <laughs> oh, thank you, Bob Warren. Come on, sit down here, Tommy Sands. Oh. Ernie Ford says, well, I got in on it. That entitles me to the party, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> we were oh. going to go over and have a meal, you know, and I was starved to death, but now I don't think I could eat a bite. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to have uh, the meal afterwards, and old Ernie will be over there, too, the whole gang. Tommy Sands, just two weeks ago, Tonight, you were singing Dimitri Tiomkin's theme song from Friendly Persuasion at the Academy Awards. Yes, sir. Quite an honor for a young man who only nine months ago came to Hollywood. Completely unknown. Now, this past Sunday, you were in New York singing on Steve Allen's show. Tomorrow night, you're appearing with Jack Benny on the Shower of Stars. Yes. And on May 9th, you open at the Roxy Theater in New York City. Now, how can uh, we're to double and go to a movie? And, uh... <laughs> Well, Tommy came to the movie a little bit later after we had gotten there, the uh, two girls and myself, and 
He stayed about 10 minutes, and then he says, well, Ryan, he says, I've got to get home. He got up, walked out, and left me sitting there with the two gals. Remember that? <laughs> well, Tommy was interested in uh, performing even as a young boy, wasn't he, Sid? Yes, he was. Uh, we did that menstrual show over at the Fullerton Presbyterian Church, mm -hmm. and we were pretty good. They took us out in the south side. We did a couple more performances. Tommy was a little disappointed. There was no rock and roll in this show. <laughs> well, thank you, Sid Lewis and Ronnie Nelson, for being here tonight. You and Tommy will really have a chance to talk about old times later on at the party at the Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel, where all of your friends have been staying. <laughs> Because I ought to have a girl. While Chicago is your home, you and your mother would take yearly trips to visit your uncle and aunt, who lived on a farm outside of Shreveport, Louisiana. Remember? Yes, sir. Yeah. One of these trips, when you're about eight years old, you listen to the radio every morning. You hear Harmy Smith and Otis Eccles, singers of country songs, on radio station KWKH in Shreveport. Yes, sir. Tommy told me that he'd rather meet Harmy Smith and Otis Eccles than anyone in the world. No need to tell you who that is, That's Tommy. Your number one fan, your mom, Mrs. Grace Sands. Oh, mom. <laughs> stand over here. I tell you, she's so happy this thing is finally underway, Tommy. She's had to keep this secret. I bet you wondering why she... You know, I was wondering why she was so nervous. We were just going over to Mr. Ford's to eat dinner, you know, and she was so down. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? We, we couldn't hardly get her in the car. She said, I'm not going to go. I'm not going to go. <laughs> oh, I tell you, it's really been a chore, but bless your heart.